Nowhere in the scripture does it teach that you had to search and pursue happiness. You find happiness as you do your duty. You find happiness as you lead a disciplined life before God. Nothing else can fill it. Marriage can't fill it. Drugs can't fill it. Sex can't fill it. Alcohol can't fill it. But the person of Jesus Christ can fill it. Good morning. So I'm walking from the coffee house up this walkway and there's those double doors there and I'm getting ready to come in and come towards the sanctuary. And these two beautiful little girls come walking through with their mother. They're so excited. They're, they're running and this one stops and she goes like this. She's in front of me. She goes, do you like this dress? <laughs> I go, I love this dress. And she goes, it's red. <laughs> I go, I go yeah, it is red. And then I walked in and we're singing, there's joy in the house of the Lord. And I think there's some joy out there too. This little girl is loving that dress. Philippians, known as the epistle of joy, but also known as one of the prison epistles because, well, the apostle Paul writes it from prison in Rome. In fact, when he was in Philippi, his first visit to Philippi, he had been there once, and then he came back again, and then he came back another time, and now a decade later, he begins to write this letter. And I want to share just a little bit with you about his, his first time there, as Paul's on his second missionary journey. And I'll just be reading from the, the book of Acts to give you just a little bit of background of the Apostle Paul and his first visit to that really thriving city at that time known as Philippi. But let's pray. Lord, as we open your word, as we spend some time there and you spend some time in our hearts digging around by the power and the presence of your word and by your spirit, that we would be open, that we would have ears to hear and a heart to respond and a a life that is surrendered to that which is true, your word. So Lord, today, help us focus, help us hear, help us respond. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. So now when they had gone through Phrygia, this is Paul, in the region of Galatia, they were forbidden, and, and no one really understands completely how this happened. They were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Now, that's a weird verse, right? Forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit didn't permit them. So passing, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. And it was a man from Macedonia. Paul's having this vision, and it says, this, this man stands up and pleads with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding, well, the Lord's called us to preach the gospel to them. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran straight course to Samothrace, and next came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony, and we were staying in the city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. You had to have a certain number of men, Jewish men, to have a synagogue. And apparently in Philippi at that time, they didn't have them. But there was a customary place when there wasn't a synagogue would be by some moving water, some living water where people would meet to pray. So Paul goes down there. There's women there. And there's a certain woman named Lydia. She heard us, verse 14 of of Acts, and she says she was a seller of purple. It's implied by that she's a wealthy woman. She's come 
uh, down from uh, the city of Thyatira, who she worshipped God. And here's what happens as Paul's sharing there by the river. It says, the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household, could have been her, her family, could be her servants, it could be both, they were baptized. And they begged us. If you've judged me, she says, to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And so she persuaded us. So Paul and Silas and whoever else might be traveling with him, she obviously a wealthy woman, has a large home, invites them to stay. And Paul's probably thinking, man, was that vision right? We're here. People are getting saved. They've been baptized. We've got a free place to stay. And, and as we went to prayer, another time, a certain slave girl that was possessed with a spirit of divination, she was a fortune teller, and she had a, a demon, and she brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. So she's, she's a fortune teller, and these men are controlling her, and, and she's making money for them. And she followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, these men are servants of the Most High God. And she did it day after day. And Paul was greatly annoyed. And he said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Now here's what happens. When her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, money driving this thing, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities, brought them to the magistrates, and they said, these men being Jews trouble our city. Mostly their pocketbooks is what he's talking about. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us. They could care less. It's all about the bottom line. Then the multitude rose up together against them. The magistrates tore their clothes, commanded them to be beaten with rods. And all of a sudden, Paul's going, maybe that vision was, wasn't right. I'm not sure. He's being beaten with rods. And when they laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely Having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison, the, the strongest, darkest, deepest part of the dungeon, fastened their feet in stocks, and at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, singing hymns to God. Prisoners were all listening, like, what in the world? These guys were beaten, they're locked up, they're singing worship songs, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, the foundations of the prison are shaken, the doors swing open, everyone's chains are loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep, seeing this situation, supposing they had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called out with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm. We're all here. He called for a light, ran in, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll be saved in your whole household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour, washed their stripes, and immediately he and his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. This is the birth of the church of Philippi, an earthquake, an imprisonment. People getting baptized. This is, this is an amazing scenario. And 10 years later, now the Apostle Paul is writing back to this church. And the opening verses of the book of Philippi have some amazing things to say to us about our own relationship with the Lord. We'll start with verse 1. Paul and Timothy bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with bishops and deacons. A bishop is simply a, a word for pastor, leader. This other word that's used there when he talks about deacons, that would just be someone who works and serves in the church. So Paul says, I want to greet those who are really serving. I want to greet the, the pastors. I want to greet the leaders. And he also says, to all the saints in Christ. Now here's where I want you to listen. Here's where I want you to tune in. 
Paul mentions here in the first verse kind of four, or at least implies, some aspects of our walk, our relationship with Jesus Christ. First, he says, to all the saints who are in Christ. They're in him. That's their source of life. That's, that's where all believers live. We live in Christ. In him, we live and move and have our very being. See, there was a time when the Philippians and you and I were without Christ. We, we, we didn't know him. He wasn't in us. We weren't in him. In fact, when he wrote the church in Ephesus in chapter 2, he, he gives some interesting verses about this kind of scenario. He says, at that time, you were without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, no hope without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So Paul says to those in Philippi, and I believe to you and I, that we are now in Christ. It's a whole different life. It's a whole new experience. In fact, listen to what he says. I'll, I'll read some more verses from Ephesians. He says, you, he made alive. You were dead in your sins. And once you once walked according to the courses of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, among whom also you once conducted yourselves in lusts, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, made us alive together in Christ, by grace you have been saved. See, here's the thing. Every person here, every one of us at one time, were living life without Christ. I know I was. Without his love, without his direction, without his hope. And God reached out to us. And like those in Philippi, we are now in Christ, experiencing the life of Christ. We enter into his life, and he enters into our life, it's like that verse in, in, in the book of Revelation, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you open, I will come in. And he does. We, we, we become not only in Christ, but we become personally involved with Christ. Like Paul says uh, of him and uh, Timothy, he says, we're, we're bondservants of Jesus Christ. We're volunteer slaves, he says. So, so not only are we in Christ, but we begin to find ourselves involved with Christ. See, we don't, here's the thing, the, the amazing thing about being a Christian. It's not that we just believe what he said or did. A lot of people believe. But it goes beyond that. We become part of him. Jesus put it this way. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. You draw all your nourishment, your source of life from me. You're in me, and I'm in you. We're part of his family, part of his body. If anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things pass away. Behold, all things become new. So, so we start off without Christ. We find ourselves in Christ. And then we also, like Paul and Timothy, begin to serve Christ. And then one day, not just in Christ, but literally one day we'll be with Christ forever and ever and ever. I have an older brother who passed away in uh, 2011, very unexpectedly. I believe my brother Yancey is with Christ. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I, I believe my mom who passed away is with Christ. I believe my, my, my wife's father, Richard Norton, is with Christ. I believe Chris Zinn, the guy who, who knelt with me on the corner of this piece of property and was just a bunch of pine trees, and he said, John, I believe God wants this to be a beachhead for people to come to know the Lord. I believe Chris, who died at the age of 30, is with Christ. 
I believe Chuck Smith, who stood up here one day and dedicated this building and passed away not long ago, is with Christ. We're without Christ at one time in our life. We're in Christ. We begin to serve Christ. And one day, we'll be with him forever and ever and ever. This Paul, so Paul begins. He says, do all the saints in Christ who are in Philippi with the pastors and those who serve. And then he says, grace to you, verse 2, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He uses this greeting, grace and peace, over and over again in a lot of his letters. You know, the whole New Testament, all these letters are churches that Paul wrote to. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippi, Corinthians, you go on and on. Paul saying grace and peace over and over again. And grace and peace are kind of like the H2O of Christians. Kind of like the, the atmosphere, the, the nitrogen and oxygen, so to speak. It, it's the atmosphere. It's, it's what you and I begin to live in and to experience as we are in Christ. We are in constant need of grace and peace. I mean, how, how desperately do we need peace in the days that we are living in right now? Grace and peace, he says. Grace, we, we understand, is, you know, this, this, this getting what we don't deserve, this forgiveness, and, and we all totally deserve to be judged and corrected, and yet God gives grace, and he fills us with his favor and his peace that passes understanding. And so Paul opens up this letter to those in Philippi that he loved dearly, and he says, you're in Christ. That's a wonderful thing to know. And you, you have God's grace, and you can receive his peace. And then he says, I thank God, in verse 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. And so he's thinking. He, he's remembering. Have any people that sometimes you think back on and go, I thank God for that person in my life. Paul's probably thinking of Lydia there by, by the river who, who took him in, the, the jailer and his family and all those who, who helped him. I mean, even the irritating people. And you'll find as we get to the, the, the last chapters of, of Philippians, don't go there now, but there's some irritating people in the church of Philippi. How many of you know some irritating people in this church? No, don't, don't raise your hand. Because <laughs> there's not any. <laughs> They're always around. You know, as a, as a believer now for many, many years, I can look back and I can say, I thank my God on every remembrance. I remember my very first pastor. There was a bunch of us long-haired surfers who who got saved, and uh, it's, a, it's a crazy story, but a bunch of us started coming to the Lord, and they actually gave us a school bus, and we'd park it in Guffrey's proper, and all these young people would get on, and we'd go over the bridge to the, we were going to Brownsville Assembly at that time, and we would drive over there in the bus and pile out, and you know, all these people were looking at us like we were like aliens, you know, we had long hair, and some guys had shorts on, I mean, it was just like, they'd never seen this before. But the pastor, this big, giant, Pentecostal guy from Arkansas, he would come out to the beach with his suit on and his wingtip shoes. And he'd walk down by the edge of the pier, and we'd all be out there surfing. And I'll never forget, his name was Don Cox, and Don would just stand there. He'd watch us, and we'd come in, and, and he'd say, how's my boys? And we're thinking, who is this crazy pastor? You know, he's, he's, he, he, he knows nothing about surfing, and he's just standing there watching us. And, and, and I think back, he started a, a new believers class. None of us knew anything about the Bible. They gave us all the same Bible, a paperback, and we didn't know how to go from Matthew to, you know, they would go, turn to page 17. You know, and we're like, okay. And, and he invested in us. He, he, he convinced me that I should go off to Bible college. And and, and I think back on Don, he, he was an amazing individual in my life, and he, he challenged me. He said, John, you should go. I go, no, Pastor Cox, that's, that's in Lakeland. There's, it's, it's, there's no coast right there. He's like, yeah, but you need to go. 
And there was a group of us, a small group of us out of that church, young guys who had gotten saved who went off to Bible college. And we'd come back, you know, during spring break or whatever, and we'd all be sitting in church, and he'd go, my boys are here, I'm going to have them come up and share something. And it was like, who is this guy who, who, who's investing in us? And, and then when I was away in seminary, I had a, a pastor who, who, who took interest in me and have good friends who prayed for me. When my, when my brother passed away, I had this pastor friend in Santa Barbara, and then he moved to Maui. And, and let me just say this. It's really nice to have a friend who lives in Maui. Okay, I just want to say that. So he would call me for like almost two weeks every day at the same time, and he would say, John, how are you? I'm praying for you, thinking about you. What's going on? You need to come to Maui. You need to visit. And for like two solid weeks after my brother passed away, this pastor called me almost every day at the same time. I would look at the phone, i go, oh, it's, it, yeah, it's Ricky. Ricky's calling. And like, like Paul, he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. You know, here, here's, the, here's the thing. You should be a person that when someone thinks about those who encourage, those who strengthen, those who've ministered, you should be one of those that they should say, oh, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Those who've encouraged you to stir up the gifts within you. Jesus speaking to you through everyday people in your life. This is what Paul is saying. He's saying, hey, to those in Christ who, who have been uh, filled with God's grace and peace, I, I thank the Lord for you, for, for, for all the remembrance of you. And Paul sees them not just as they are, but, but look what he goes on to say. He says, always in every prayer of my mind, making requests for you with all joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day that I met you. Remember, I was down by the river, and then I was in jail, and there was an earthquake. Remember all that? Until now. And I'm confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul says, God's doing a work in you. And he's going to complete it. He sees them not just as they are now, but what the Lord's going to do in them over the years, over the months, over the weeks. I have a, a really good friend whom I've known before I was a Christian and after I was a Christian not long ago, I had the privilege, I was in California, he lives there in San Diego, of baptizing his two sons, who are now probably 13 and 15. They were going to a church that didn't believe in immersion, and he, he called me up, he knew I was out there, and he said, hey, would you baptize my sons? I go, I would love to do that. So I went down to a certain place and met him. Well, his name is Hank Warner, and he's a surfboard shaper, that's what he does. And he's a very talented one, he's well known all over the the, the coast of California as a shaper. And he actually shaped uh, this surfboard for me right here. And I sent him uh, my bumper sticker that said Coastline, and he glassed it inside the surfboard. And it's on the back as well. But a surfboard, in case you don't know it, starts off like that or like this. It's just a piece of grubby old, this is the best blank. I, they call them blanks. This is the best one I can find around here. Usually they're really big like that. So a, surf, a, a shaper will take this, and I remember when I was asked Hank to make me a board, I didn't know he was going to give it to me, but he did. And he said, well, come to, my, come to my shaping room out in San Diego. I was out there, and I went in, and Hank showed me the blank. It looked, it looked more like that. And he goes, so what do you think? I go, I, I, no, that doesn't look too good. <laughs> he says, well, I'll shape the board, I'll be done, and it'll be glassed in a week and a half. You come back and take a look at it. So I told him, you know, he told me, we, we kind of went over the measurements of the nose, the tail, kind of, we, we decided um, how many, you know, fins we wanted in it. This is a three fin. Hank, Hank was a Christian when I was, uh, just got saved. We went to the same church together for a while with that pastor who encouraged me. So he wrote on the back, because this guy was a Pentecostal pastor, the guy we first started going to church with. So, so he wrote on the 
the back, something that pastor used to always say to us. There's, there's Hank's logo. There's John Spencer, custom shaped by Hank Warner. And it says right here, well, glory. That's because that's what the pastor always said. <laughs> so he's got that on there. But he took it from something that looked like that to something that now looks like this. And I've ridden this board many times. Uh, and Hank, this, this great friend of mine who shaped it, he, um, he saw this in his mind. All I saw was that. I thought, how in the world? And Paul, similar to that, saw those in Philippi. And he said, you know, you might feel like this, but God's not through with you yet. In fact, he says there in verse 6, I'm confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it. And here's the thing. He'll shape, he'll fashion, he'll make it to, to, to your very distinct gifts and callings, and, 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 and you turn out something totally different than what you once looked like. And this is what Paul's talking about, confident of this very thing. See, when, when I walked into Hank's shaping room, and I knew who he was and what he could do. Uh, he'd been a shaper, gosh, since the 60s. And I, I was confident that something like this was coming from something like that. And Paul, in, in a similar way, is saying, I'm very confident in what the Lord's going to do in your life. And he will. If you'll trust him, if you'll be in him. He's going to shape and fasten you. God has begun to shape and form your life, but here's the deal. He's not finished, is he? And it's not always based on how you feel. I had a guy call me this week. He's going through some medical problems, and here's what he said to me. He said, Pastor John, I know I've surrendered to the Lord. I know I've accepted the Lord, but I just don't feel it. And I said, I said, I've been married this year 44 years to my wife. I know I love her, but sometimes I don't feel it. <laughs> and I'm sure it's vice versa. Maybe more, <laughs> more the other way. And he said, okay, I get it. God is doing a work. He's the one who can change you and bring you to completion, but he also knows how to bring circumstances into your life and people. And we must be willing to be willing to surrender to the ways that he shapes and fashions us. Just like a blank has to surrender to that plane and that shaping and that, you know, conforming it to the right image to guide and direct. See, one, one thing's very true. I never, maybe this seems weird, I never wanted to plant a church. I never wanted to start a church. I mean, I've been to Bible college and seminary. And, and who wants to start a church, I thought? You know, you've got to build buildings. You, there's no money. There's no insurance. There's nothing. You're in a school. I thought, no, I went to seminary and Bible college. I, I want to start where there, where there is some money, where there is a job, where there's a building. And yet the Lord worked all these different weird circumstances in my life And for 38 years, I've been doing this. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. But I would have never chosen it. But God, who's shaping and fashioning and forming each of us, brings circumstances and people and situations into our life. And, and sometimes we wonder, what in the world is going on? And God says, trust me. In fact, he, Paul puts it this way. He says, I'm confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And in the book of Jude, we have this verse, chapter 1, verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you one day faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And that's where he's taking us. That's what he's doing. As those in Philippi read this letter, they're probably thinking, Wow, Paul, he, he, he remembers us, he's, he's speaking grace and peace over us, he, 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 he's thinking about the completed work that God's going to do in us, you know, you know, 
Paul, you're, you're, you're too kind. You're, you're too benevolent to us. And yet, Paul, probably thinking of this, says in verse 7, it's right for me to think of this of you, all because I have you in my heart. And as much as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me in grace. In verse 8, chapter 1, For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And here we look at not just Paul's love for them, but he says God's affection, God's love. As those in Philippi are reading this letter and thinking, you know, Paul loves us, he's praying for us, he's remembering us, he's too kind and complimentary to us. He says, no, it's, it's right for me. And Paul shares with them that the affection he has, it's not just his affection. He, he shares the origin of it, the, the reason for it. He says, for God is my witness. I long for you all, but it's with the affection, the love of Jesus Christ. That's how you can love people who are sometimes hard to love. You let the Lord love them through you. That's what Paul is saying. See, Jesus sees people. Listen, Jesus sees you. He sees me. He sees people differently than you and I do. You have to remember that. There's the woman at the well. And even Jesus' disciples come walking up and go, What's he doing talking to her? She's a Samaritan. We've got, we've got racial issues with that woman. We've got religious issues with that woman. We've got gender issues with that woman. We've got cultural issues with that woman. But Jesus saw her so differently than anyone else saw her. He loved her. I, I see you, Paul says, with the affection of Jesus Christ. Jesus saw lepers who were, were the outcasts, the untouchables, the unclean. He saw them different than anyone else saw them. He touched them. He actually went near them. The man with the withered hand in the, in the synagogue, and Jesus walks in, and, and that man should not even have been in the synagogue. He was unclean. He had a, he had a deformity. But Jesus healed him there. Jesus walks into a room, and he sees people differently than you and I see them. He sees you. He sees me differently than anyone else sees me, and he loves you. He sees people through you. Jesus is living in you, you're living in him, and he wants to see people through you in a way that you and I probably won't look at them. Here we are, we're, we're in Christ, he says. We experience his, his grace and his peace. We're, we're connected together because of Christ in the fellowship of the gospel, it says in verse 4 and 5. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day into now, and God's doing this amazing work in you. And now we begin to love others also with the affection of Christ. And then he says in verse 9 something very powerful. And this I pray, that your love, the affection that you have, and the affection that Christ wants to share through you, may abound more and more in knowledge and in discernment. Your love may abound. It'll grow. It may be seen, not just talked about. It can be heard. It can be lived out in lies. And Paul is trying to stir them up and motivate them. I, I want you to, he says, to, to love people. I want you to have a sense of love for Christ and others, to, to let the love of Christ be seen and heard, let it abound. In other words, he's saying more and more, not just faith, because faith without works is dead. And he adds some interesting words here. That your, that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment. Knowledge. 
knowledge connected to love and discernment connected to knowledge and love. See, there's a time in love to help people. And there's a time in love with discernment not to help people, right? Because God might be doing something in their life that they need to go through and love sometimes just wants to jump in there, but sometimes discernment, if we really look into the situation and pray, we need to allow the Lord to take them through a situation to correct them, to grow them, to help them, to shape them, to fashion them through all the stuff of life. Now, I love the story. In fact, it was one of the first sermons I ever preached because I felt someone like this guy, the prodigal son. And I've often wondered, you know, here he is in trouble, no money, no friends, he's at the bottom of life, he's a good Jewish boy feeding swine, he's eating their food, he ended up where he, he never wanted to be. And I think, did the dad know where he was? Could he have gone and rescued him out of the pigsty? Could he have taken him some money and some food and could he have gotten him a, a, some help? Uh, he, he possibly knew where he was, but it doesn't go after him. He had taken the money. He had taken in his inheritance. He had kind of waved off his dad and the family and said, I'm doing my own thing. This dad said, okay, let's see how that works out. You know the story. He didn't help him. Maybe he couldn't help him, but he certainly didn't help him until he came back. And you know what? When he came back, he was ready to be helped. And sometimes that's a situation in life with people. Sometimes that's a situation in life with your kids, with, with people you're connected to. Don't, don't finance a, a friend or a child's rebellion. Don't, don't step in somewhere. Use love, but knowledge and discernment. You know, don't, don't finance a, a friend or, or, or child's immorality. Well, I got to set them up. You use love, but use discernment. There's a difference between love and indulging a person's rebellion. And Paul is saying, hey, with love, use knowledge and discernment. Sometimes difficulty in life is better than rescue. Sometimes we need to go through some stuff. We also, as believers, need to have love with discernment. And Paul, Paul mentions several things that love and knowledge with discernment can do. Look what he says. That you, I pray, verse 9, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that, and here are some of the fruits of it, that you may approve the things that are excellent. So number one, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in Christ, I've got his love and his grace, he's, he's put me into a group of fellowship of the gospel, and he's, he's, he's shaping and fashioning me, he's given me his, his love so I can see others the way he sees them, but with knowledge and discernment, and part of what that does for me is I can approve the things that are excellent, or I put it like this, be able to put things in right priority in the way that I should live and respond to people and situations in my life, that I can prove those things that are excellent, those things in life that matter the most, because of his love and his discernment and that knowledge, that I don't waste my life on those things that are trivial and don't lead anywhere or have no eternal value to them. He says, this, this knowledge with discernment because of the love of Christ helps me get life in focus. See, so I, don't, I, don't, I still enjoy this, but there's one time when I live for this. There's a southeast wind blowing. Lynn, I might be in Panama City, but I'll be home before noon. No, you won't. You'll be home at dark. No, I promise. No, we've been through this before, haven't we? God begins to give you love and discernment and knowledge. Well, what's more important to me? Is it my wife and my kids are paddling around in the Gulf? 
God, God begins to take your life and put things in right priority and allowing God to, to love, to be lived through you with wisdom and discernment. And you begin to focus, you, you begin to prove that which is most excellent on those things that, that, that have value, your time, your, your, your resources, your, your gifting. God begins to do that as you allow him to do it. And he helps you even to do it in the lives of of others. Look what he says, that you may approve, verse 10, the things that are excellent, and that you may be sincere and without offense. So approve those things, put in right priority those things of life, and then that you might be sincere. Many of you know that the word sincere and in, the, in Latin, means without wax. and the Greek, it means sun, S-U-N, tested. In those days, in that time, ancient world, a lot of images were, were fashioned and shaped out of pottery. A lot of vessels were. And when merchants would sell them, if they had cracks or flaws, they would fill them with wax. So you couldn't tell if it had a crack in it. Couldn't tell if it was flawed. Well, you needed to find out if this piece of pottery you were buying was sincere. So you would take it out and put it in the sun. And the sun would heat it up. And if there were cracks or flaws, you would be putting it in the Greek through the sun test. Or in the Latin, is it without wax? And, and so the vessel, you would find out pretty soon, you know, if, if, the, if the wax melted, you'd see the cracks and he said, let love, let discernment lead you to make choices and decisions and create a real genuine walk for you with the Lord. Let this love and discernment, you know, bring things into focus and priority so that you might live a real genuine walk with the Lord. In other words, not a phony life, not one that covers up all the time. That you, you're hiding and covering up those, those things in your life that, well, you know, no, see, I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to. No, wait a minute. And our lives will begin, he says, and he goes on here. It's amazing what he, how he brings us together. And your life will be filled, verse 11, instead of with hiding and covering up, be filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. You'll be filled, not with wax, not with things that you have to make excuses for or be embarrassed by if someone found out. If we were to take it out into the sun, so to speak, and let the light shine on it so all could see. But, but those things, you'll be filled with the fruits of, of righteousness, not the carnal things, not the phony things, not the fleshly things, but things like, well, fruits of righteousness, like joy and love and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control. Those are the real things. Those are the eternal things. Those are the things that come to your life, not by just self-will, but through this relationship of being in Christ and Christ being in you. Growth in the love of Christ, using wisdom and discernment. I mean, as you, as you think about these first 11 verses, and that's as far as we go, what did Jesus say to his disciples when he called them? He said, follow me, and I will make you. I'll, I'll shape you. I'll, I'll fashion you into fishers of men through all kinds of ways. And we live in a culture right now through all kinds of influences, all kinds of voices, trying to make us into all kinds of images and lifestyles. A lot of them are fake and phony. You know, I, I met with a guy, well, I met a guy yesterday, and he just moved back from Haiti. He'd been living there for 11 years. Got out right before the assassination, right before the earthquake, right before mayhem, really which is going on in Haiti right now. Gangs are running the streets. It's a crazy time. 
He's got three beautiful kids. He says, you know, our kids grew up in Haiti being homeschooled. He goes, now we've got them in the public school here in Gulf Breeze. So how's that going for you? He goes, he says, it's crazy. Our kids have never been exposed to this designer clothes world. So our kids have never been exposed to these videos that they show about gender and homosexuality and all that. He goes, Haiti was actually better. I go, I get it. I said, we, we're, we're in a culture right now where, where all these voices and all these lifestyles and all these images are coming our way. And Jesus, speaking through the Apostle Paul to those in Philippi who lived also in a crazy culture, women with demons and telling fortunes and all the crazy things going on there. He says, be filled with the fruits of righteousness. Use love and may, may you abound with knowledge and discernment. If ever we needed knowledge and discernment, it, it, it's today. And allowing those fruits to be in our life. And lot, letting the Lord do the work in you and I, His process. Being part of the church, the body. See, a church, pl please listen, please listen to this. A church is not a club of people who once upon a time had a religious experience and then signed up to live on the memory of that experience for the rest of their life. No, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real everyday walk with love and discernment, being in Christ with a group of people, remembering all that God has done and looking at what he's continuing to do. And there's just, there's, there's seven basic characteristics that, that occur and seven great truths that come out of these 11 verses. And I'm just going to put them up here on the, on the screen. We're in Christ. He, he, to, to all the saints who are in Christ, we, we, we experience grace and peace. We're connected together in the fellowship of the gospel. And that's not just sharing how to get saved, but all that the gospel brings into our lives. All the, the things that God pours into our hearts and minds. We're, 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 we're his work. He's, he's completing something in us. He's, he's loving others through us, that affection of Christ. And he's, he's helping us be real. He says, you know, use discernment and, and, and be without wax. Let Take the sun test and, and don't be phony uh, and filling us with the fruits of righteousness. You and I should be able to, to like that little girl, as, as I was walking up the stairs, say, you like this, you like this life? Yeah, I like it. It's, it's Jesus. And he's real. And he has all these things that he's, and, and, and Paul, as he opens up this letter to a place, I mean, think about it. If you were writing this letter. Would you say, man, I had a great time in Philippi. I was locked in the inner prison, and they beat the snot out of me with rods. No, he, he, he says, I was called over there by vision. At first, I didn't even meet any men. It was just a bunch of women down by the river. And then I realized it was the jailer. It was the Macedonian man who said, come over and help us. And God put me in an inner prison where I never wanted to be in my whole life. I would have never wanted to be in that situation. Beaten with rods, stripes on my back, and the, the, the building began to shake. If it's not bad enough, we've been beaten, we're in the prison. Now there's an earthquake. We're done for. And all the chains fell off, the door swung open, the jailer appears, and here's what he says. What must I do to be saved? And Paul realized, oh my goodness, this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. And so he begins this letter, thanking God in remembrance, his affection for them, the grace and peace to them, that they're in Christ and all the different things that God's doing in them. And he opens this up and he closes out with verse 11 here saying, and I want you to be filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. And that's what he wants for you. That's what he wants for me, to be sincere, sun-tested, without wax, filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and the praise 
of God. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. And we're going to close in just a moment with our normal benediction. But Rob's going to lead us in an old, old hymn that some of you will be familiar with and some of you probably won't. But it's about having Christ live in you and you living with him.